You know, I think that the Fourth Amendment has not kept pace with the technological realities of the modern world. Although, uh, as I will explain in a moment, uh, we may be at the beginning of a revolution in Fourth Amendment protection in the United States. And it may be that our courts are just beginning to see the ways in which technology will reshape our needs here. Um, the primary point that I would make um, is that the Fourth Amendment has not always been the primary guarantor of our privacy. Uh, in some sense, the high cost of surveillance uh, has been the primary guarantor of our, pri of our privacy. Uh, law enforcement simply didn't have the resources to follow very many of us for very much of the time. Uh, and if law enforcement wanted to track an individual, that might have required a huge investment of resources, teams of officers to follow that person around. And of course, technology has brought those costs from very high to negligible. Uh, and now it's possible for law enforcement to track all of us um, at, at almost no cost with a laptop computer um, simply by contacting the technology companies that are tracking us and getting that information for them. Uh, and so now we're going to need to have constitutional law uh, in places where we didn't necessarily need it before uh, because of how easy it is for the government to track us and because of the ways in which that reshapes the power relationship between uh, governments and individuals. Um, it, specifically with respect to the Fourth Amendment, um, since the 1960s, the test that our courts have applied uh, to determine whether citizens are uh, entitled to Fourth Amendment protections is, do we have a reasonable expectation of privacy uh, with respect to whatever is being invaded um, by the government? And remember, the Fourth Amendment applies only to the government. Uh, it has nothing to say about intrusions by private corporations into our privacy. The Fourth Amendment is a limitation on government surveillance. Uh, it is not a limitation on corporate or business um, surveillance. Uh, now, many people have criticized that test, the expectation of privacy test, because it seems circular. Um, it, if, if we're really asking what kinds of privacy expectations are reasonable, um, uh, you can see how that can become a one-way ratchet, that, that the more surveillance we're subjected to, the less reasonable it is for us to expect more privacy, uh, and then the protection itself under the law would go down. But, but that's not generally how the courts have applied the Fourth Amendment test. Uh, in general, there has been a normative component where they have asked, um, is this something that we should be protecting? Um, you know, the second part of the Fourth Amendment doctrine that has uh, that is in need of revitalization um, is something that we call in the United States the third party doctrine. Uh, and this is a doctrine that the Supreme Court came up with in the, in the 1970s, where they said essentially that if we voluntarily share data or information with a third party, we've waived constitutional protection over that data with respect to the government. And so if you give information to a bank, you can't then complain when the government goes to the bank to get those records. Uh, if you give information to a phone company, you can't complain when the government goes to the phone company to get those records. Well, every time you use a phone, you're giving information to a phone company because in order to use the service, uh, you have to give them your location, you have to dial the number, uh, and all of that information has been available until recently to, to the government in the United States um, without a warrant under the Fourth Amendment. Uh, I, I mentioned a moment ago that we might be undergoing um, a, a positive revolution in Fourth Amendment doctrine, I'll discuss briefly two cases. In 2012, our Supreme Court held for the first time um, that GPS tracking of an individual's location um, is a search under the Fourth Amendment. Uh, and this was a big shock to the government. I mean, the government's position was, if you're driving a car around in public where it can be observed by anybody, how can you have a constitutional expectation of privacy in where you drive? Uh, and the court recognized that there's a difference between following someone around um, um, on a series of trips and tracking their location at all hours over a long period of time. You can learn everything about an individual in 20 or 30 or 40 days of tracking that person's location. Um, so that was a very important decision. Uh, and we'll see now whether that signals a broader Fourth Amendment revolution. The second case um, involved whether the police in the United States uh, when they arrest someone, can search their cell phone or smartphone without getting a warrant from a judge. Um, typically, the police are allowed to search your body and the, your, the objects on you when they arrest you to make sure that uh, you don't have weapons, 
to see if you might be trying to get rid of contraband. Uh, and the police had been using this rule in order to do warrantless searches of people's smartphones, which have huge amounts of data on them, medical records, other personal um, kinds of information. And the Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision in 2014, said to the government, in these words, get a warrant, um, that, that essentially um, technology has changed the balance here and where we might have uh, sided with law enforcement in the past, now we're siding with privacy. So that was somewhat of a long answer, um, but, but I hope it will be helpful to non-American students.